Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wilson Center on 50 by 50 Day. My name is Gwen Young, and I'm the director of the Global Women's Leadership Initiative. And I'd like to welcome you to Getting to 5050, a framework toward action for a more equal world. And this is part of a 50 by 50 global conversation. So for some of you that may not know, we have a very simple mission at the Women in Public Service Project here at the Wilson Center, is to accelerate global progress towards women's equal participation in policy and political leadership to create more dynamic and inclusive institutions that leverage the full potential of the world's population and to change the way global solutions are forged. So it's probably easier to say that our goal is to ensure that by 2050, women hold 50% of leadership positions across governments and across the globe, hence the 50 by 50 pen. And we are honored today to be a part of the 50 by 50 day and the commitment of Let It Ripple Studios towards 50 by 50. So we are proud to partner with them. And today there are over 30,000 excuse me, there are over 30, events taking place in companies, schools, classrooms, museums, and homes across the globe to work towards getting to a more gender balanced world that's better for everyone across all parts of society, for the economy and politics to culture and home. So we're excited to gauge in women leaders, policymakers, and gender parity champions, such as those on stage and across the globe. So as a part of 50 by 50 Day, Tiffany Schlein and the Let It Ripple Film Studio have developed a short film, What If? And it imagines the gender balanced world we are all working for. Tiffany Schlein, co-founder of 50 by 50 Day, will introduce the film via recorded remarks. After the screening, we'll move on to our panel We'll discuss this and we will engage with yourselves as the audience as to what if and how do we get there. So please enjoy What If, the latest film for social good from Let It Ripple Studios. Hello and welcome to 5050 Day. My name is Tiffany Schlein. I'm one of the co-founders. I'm so excited about your event. I wish I could be there in person, but this is the next best thing. Today, we are premiering our new film, four minute film called Why Pledge 5050. And uh, it launches this beautiful website action pledge tool that April 6 did, whypledge5050.org. And so of course, we'd love for you to watch the film, make a pledge, share your pledge, extra bonus points if you do a video of why that pledge was important to you. We absolutely love our partnership with the Women in Public Service Project at the Wilson Center. You're all doing such important work in making the world we want to see a reality. So this is wonderful that you've pulled together such an amazing event. We're excited to feature it to the thousands of events that are happening all over the world right now. Hello and welcome to 5050 Day. My name is Tiffany Schlein. I'm There are 195 countries in the world, each with their own stories and struggles in creating a more gender balanced world. One that's not just better for women, but for everyone. And I know in the United States where I live, we're at this really big moment where there's a lot of conversation about gender and power. And a lot of people wanting things to change. to imagine what that world could look like. Let's begin with the very minor, unheated topic of American politics. The United States is a democracy with 519,682 elected officials, whose job it is to represent us and make decisions on our behalf. But do they look like our population? No. Take Congress. In its all-time most diverse Congress ever, it's still 81% men and 81% white. Imagine what would change if our decision makers actually reflected who we are, which includes 50% women. And this is not a partisan issue. In fact, studies show that more women in government from both sides lead to more bipartisan ideas and a more productive, functional government. Like when the Swedish parliament reached a critical mass of women 
they changed their workday to end at 6 p.m. rather than 10. With the same productivity. Now, what if we saw that critical mass not just in politics, but across all parts of our lives? What would it look like if half the CEOs out there were women? To start, countless studies show we'd have more sustainable, profitable businesses. But we probably also have what the happiest countries in the world have. Things like pay equality and parental leave for all genders. Maybe even some stylish clogs. Imagine how those kind of changes would shift our culture as a whole and change your life or someone you love. Now imagine if the curriculum shaping future generations actually reflected those future generations. All genders, all races, all intersecting issues. And imagine if our TV, movies, and news did the same. And finally, if our homes were free of centuries-old gender expectations. And we finally have a critical mass wanting to make that change. So what specific things can you do? Whether you're a CEO, an employee, a student, or parent, you make hundreds of decisions every day that can either push you away from a gender-balanced world or bring you closer to it. I pledge to create a paid family leave policy. I pledge to support women-owned businesses. I pledge to respect people's preferred pronouns. I pledge to educate myself about an issue that doesn't directly impact my life. I pledge to go in every election, big or small. I pledge to help get the Equal Rights Amendment ratified and passed. I pledge to take an unconscious bias test. I pledge to break as many stereotypes as possible. We don't have all the answers, but we do have 50 very specific things you can do to get started. To promote women into executive teams. I pledge to stand up when somebody says something derogatory about women. a lot of energy that's exciting um, so before I sit down and start talking about the pledges I'm warning the panel I'd like to introduce our panelists are today to my far left we have ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield who was the former assistant secretary of state for African affairs at the US Department of State to her right we have Peli Sojanel who's the worldwide chief creative officer for Barrow Bogle and Haggerty and I would like to say uh, I'm proud. He's a member of the Advisory Council for the Women in Public Service Project here. So we're honored to have you here today, just in from Los Angeles. Jessica Leslie, who is the Director of Programs for Vital Voices Global Partnerships. Very glad to have you guys here today as a key partner. And Deputy Ambassador of Canada to the United States, Kirsten Hillman. Welcome. So before I launch into the, the substance, I know, Linda, you made a pledge. And we ended with the pledges. So do you want to share your pledge with us? I think I pressed several. And uh, <laughs> as you were asking, I thought, what did I, what did I pledge? Because <laughs> I, I am committed. And uh, I pledged that I was always going to raise the issue of 50-50. It's uh, an important issue, and people need to know about it. Pelly, did you make a pledge? I pledged, uh, I think it was about a year ago, to never be on a panel without a woman on it, and it seems to have, <laughs> have worked. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've achieved it. <laughs> yeah, you can go to genderavenger.com, so it's another pledge place to do it. It's great. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I have not yet made a pledge, but um, I think that for me, I'm, I'm the mother of two young girls, and so I think that it is important to ensure that they, um, in their lives are, are, and their friends, feel like they can do anything that, that boys do. So making sure that their toys and everything that comes into their lives are not um, gendered in the way that society and, and um, pushes girls to, to be. So Socialization piece. Absolutely. Kirsten. Um, I haven't made a pledge either, but I, I've seen the variety of pledge, pledges 
uh, that are possible at, and gives rise to a lot of ideas. I think that there are pledges that I would want to make in my personal life with my, I have two sons, so there's a lot of uh, education there, although I think sometimes they educate me, to be honest, on unconscious bias, on language that we use as their language evolves. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's harder for us who are somewhat older to see our language evolve. Um, and in the, in the workplace and everywhere else, unconscious bias. Because I think that, and we've talked about this before, even no matter what degree to which you feel that you're a leader and a conscious person with respect to gender issues or diversity issues, they run so much deeper than we ever really realize. And you have to get into the habit of self-checking. We were just talking before we came on stage about sort of being very conscious, very deliberate about this. And Linda, I want to turn to you and, and sort of starting that thread of, okay, we've made these pledges. How do we actually turn them into action? You know, I think you have to be constantly conscious. And sometimes you have to embarrass people hmm. when you walk in the room. And uh, I remember once visiting one of our embassies overseas that had a huge conference table. And when I walked in the room, there were no women at the table. Well, there were two. It was me and our deputy uh, ambassador, deputy chief of mission. And so I said, something is wrong with this room. And people looked around, and nobody could figure out what was wrong uh, in the room. And I finally said, there are no women heads of section here. And it was embarrassing to people to hear that. And I think you do have to embarrass people. And I also mentioned, as we were talking earlier, that I suddenly realized that my front office, I'm the chief. I didn't have any other women there. Uh, and it had not been a conscious decision. Uh, I'd had uh, several of the women move on to new positions, and I brought in uh, new people, and suddenly I realized I didn't have any women. And so I had to consciously work to ensure that I brought in uh, women to complement uh, the office. And I'll just mention one thing that sometimes I hear from women, and I also hear from African Americans, you can't have a whole room full of African Americans. People will feel uh, uncomfortable if you are the boss and your deputy is an African American. Or you can't have uh, a, a lot of women. It can't be a, a room filled with women. Uh, they're going to refer to it as the hen house. Or uh, at one point when I was in one bureau, they talked about it being uh, the sisterhood. And, and there was a problem with there being a sisterhood. You never, ever hear <coughs> when there's a room full of men that it's a problem. Uh, that yep. there are no women. Yep. No man will say, I can't choose as a deputy another man because people will feel funny about it. And so we as women have to be conscious that there is nothing wrong with having a room full of women uh, if that's what you, what you have. Absolutely. Kirsten, what's your, what's your thoughts coming also sort of from the government perspective and, and turning these commitments into action? Yeah. I, I, so I was, uh, in thinking about uh, coming here today, uh, I was thinking about how our, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, when he came to office in 2015, he put into place our first ever gender balanced federal cabinet, so 50-50 in the, in the federal cabinet. And I recently watched an interview that he did where the interviewer was talking to him about this. And the thing that I took away most from that interview was he said, you know, where we were in 2015 didn't start in 2015. Mm -hmm. And he explained how he and his team in 2014, and 2013, and 2012, when they were not in government, when they were in opposition, they were in fact a third party, made a conscious effort to go out across Canadian society and find talented uh, women in, of all walks of life, in public life, in business life, in, in you know, philanthropy, and target those women and encourage them in, uh, to, to enter public life, encourage them to run to, for office. And he was explaining how, one, it was a large effort. It was a, it was a group effort for, for he and his team, but also that it was very difficult. And what he said was, you know, when you go to a man, uh, say a, 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 a successful business or community leader, and you say, we'd be interested in having you run for, for office for our party, the men were like, yeah, you bet, let's go. I'm in, right. 
If you ask the same question of a woman, even a very talented, successful woman, more often than not, the experience was, me? Are you sure? Why? Do you think I can do it? it really? And I found that reflection of the process they'd gone through incredibly powerful at a personal level for me. And actually in thinking about the teams of people that I have worked with in, in my career, where I think often women just do not give themselves enough credit, they do not push themselves forward, and it's not only us as, as women leaders who have to help each other do that, but it's the male, it's the men leaders who have to say, yes, I mean you, I don't mean, you know, this guy, I don't mean your husband, I mean you, and you can do it, and we need you. And so he described this whole process, and then he said, therefore, they had many, many women running, and they put themselves in a position when it came time to pick a cabinet that they had a, 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 a huge number of very talented women to choose from. And I think that that is what, and this is a, this is a, a government sort of political example, um, but that can apply in any organization. That can apply in any walk of life where you're putting together a team of any sort. Getting the networks and speaking, turning to Jessica, speaking of sort of vital voices and building up that capacity, you know, talk a bit about this commitment into action and what, what you've been doing and vital voices with women across the globe. Yeah, absolutely. So we work with women leaders uh, around the world who are in public uh, public leadership positions, uh, our business women, our human rights advocates. and. And one thing that they constantly tell us is that we have to address an environment not only where women can take leadership positions, but in which they can thrive in those positions. And so that also means empowering women throughout the cycle of their, their life. And so looking at, at not just laws and policies that affect uh, women and girls, but, but those institutions and the social norms that allow gender inequities to exist and to persist. And so that means addressing everything from whether it's uh, girls' education or uh, women's economic empowerment. Sorry, can everyone just get a little closer to the Absolutely. mic? Absolutely. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, women's economic empowerment or looking at the issue of gender-based violence. If, if one in three women around the world experience some form of intimate partner violence or sexual violence by a non-partner in their lifetime, that creates huge barriers to, to women's leadership. I, I want to come, come back to that laws and policies piece. Um, but sticking on in, in Pele, so you made a commitment, you made a pledge. Was it difficult when you were like, I will only be on panels? <laughs> no, not, not really. I think, I, I think that's what's so good with pledges is that you, we walk around and think, uh, think what can we do? Uh, and it's not always easy to get all the ideas. You don't always have all the things that you can do in front of you. Uh, but to, to, to have a pledge and say, oh, yeah, I, I want to do that. that, that makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. It was a very quick decision. Uh, once it was there, uh, and I think that's uh, another thing. Not everyone. My my job is to be creative. I guess I should have come up with all these things, but not everyone can can create. So I think there, there's a need for a lot of ideas in this, and there's a lot of every 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 piece helps in this. I think. Yeah. So we we've developed here at the Women Public Service Project this sort of data platform, right? So we're operating from the premise that the institutional and systemic change is important. We, Kirsten, you and I have talked about this several times, sort of the role of data to show where you are and how you are. And what our index shows is where women are in government, sort of what position, you know, how high, um, how they got there. So what were these behaviors and these policies to, to get them there and then how much power they hold, which comes back to sort of where they sit and where, and where they're going with that. Um, how important is this data? You know, from where you said, how important is is the data? What 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 can we do with that? I know you and I have talked about we this, have. so I'll let you jump in. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, when uh, when Prime Minister Trudeau's government took office, our new trade minister at the time, uh, Minister Christian Freeland, came to. I was a I was the head of our trade policy uh, branch of our government, so the the branch that does trade negotiations. Um, and implementation of our, our international trade agreements. And she came to me and she said, I would like to understand how the positions we're putting forward in negotiations, whether it's globally at the World Trade Organization or bilaterally or in, in, in any agreements, how they impact Canadian women. And everybody was like... And that was my answer. Because <laughs> we did not have any data. 
So if she had asked me, how will this affect the Western region of our country? How will this affect our steel sector? How will this affect, you know, canola farmers from southwestern Manitoba? We could tell her that. We could have told her that that afternoon, right? Um, our banking sector, you know, you name it. We could have given that information. But we did not have sex disaggregated data of any kind that was of a quality that we could perform any kind of assessment. And actually, to be honest, we really didn't have a methodology either. I mean, there are methodologies out there, but methodologies as applied to international trade commitments, we didn't have them. And it was um, a real aha moment, to be frank. As me, I was the first woman to be the head of that agency, that sector of our government. Um, and I thought, how could I have had such a blind spot? How could I have, and you know why? Because we've never been asked the question. We've never been asked the question, and we're busy answering the questions we're asked. Um, and that one had never come before us. So we've spent a lot of time uh, trying to gather that information, trying to gather that data. There's been a lot of effort and resources put into it, and we're getting there. And now we're able to answer those questions a little bit better. And I'd love your thoughts coming mm -hmm. from the Department of State and your background with data and the evidence. You know, I was head of personnel, so yep. this was something that we were very conscious of. And uh, one of the areas that we look for uh, women in leadership positions were for ambassadorships. And so we started putting, making sure that we put women on those lists to become ambassadors. And then I started hearing from the men that, uh, you know, you don't want to get on the, they're only picking women. And particularly when I came into the Africa Bureau, they're only picking women to be ambassadors. And I finally asked for the, for the data. Like, how many women ambassadors do we actually have in Africa? Because this is causing a lot of angst among, among our male uh, uh, leadership. Well, it turned out we'd only picked eight. Eight out of 45. And so the numbers are important. So when I walk in the room and I hear people say, well, there's a sisterhood. They're only picking women. I'm like, we got eight women out of 45 of you. And yes, every time we pick a woman to be an ambassador, we are disadvantaging a man. Yes. And the reason we are is because you guys had them all before. So every time we pick one, <laughs> one of you will not get a job because before you had 44 out of the 45. Now eight of those positions have gone to women and we need to get to 50-50. Uh, our previous leadership of the State Department, uh, who recently left and will remain unnamed, said that he was going to make sure that there was a woman or uh, a person of color on every single list. But we know they're not qualified. But it's an important experience for them uh, to be on the list. And so many of us decided we didn't want to be on this list uh, of unqualified people. Uh, we wanted to be on the list of, of qualified people. And uh, I'll, I'll just mention that sometimes with women, there's always this sense, well, they're not ready. Hmm. Uh, so let's just put them on the list and start preparing them to get ready. You never hear that when we look at uh, men on a list that they're not ready. And someone recently said to me, if you had five, five criteria for, for a job, uh, a man with one of the five will always put his name forward. A woman with three of the five will say, mm, I'm, I'm not ready. I need to get those other two. We want to be 100% ready uh, because that's how we've been socialized, that we have to be bigger and better and more prepared than our male, male colleagues. And I've learned over the years that that is not necessary, that there is a lot of learning on the job and that men learn on the job as well. And we women have to prepare ourselves to learn on the job and, and, and move up. I want to pick up on that point about socialization because there's um, an Italian researcher who picked of the 10 qualities that the World Economic Forum says you have to have as a leadership, women, mothers, and caregivers in the home have seven of those 10 qualities. I mean, she mapped the qualities, and she mapped it with the tasks that you do. So I want to pick up on that, because that socialization piece is important. But the other thing that's important is not only this glass ceilings, how high women rise, but it's where women are in government. Mm -hmm. So women often, you know, you've been in Africa, I've been in Africa a long time, end up in health 
and education, they don't end up over, you know, in the Department of Defense or in other things. And so we call this, you know, the, the glass walls. You know, Pelle, I want to sort of bring you in on this glass walls. What is the, you know, what do you, what do you want to talk about with this? What does this look like from where you sit? You know, I think it's interesting that we, first of all, the, the data gap that, that we saw that, that we found mm -hmm. where, where you sit in, in hierarchy, but then that some, you know, there are not that many fire women, but not a firemen. Uh, and, you know, it's not, the, it can be, why is it only a dream for, for men or why is it supposed to be that? We all, we, we're as affected by fire. Why is only one supposed to save? Uh, so I think those things are really interesting because we talk a lot about the glass ceiling and I think the glass walls are, are about opportunity. And I think that's what it's about, Choo being able to choose opportunity, not having certain opportunity to, to pick from. And then obviously the, the layers. Um, I think also with, with data, it's so important to, to make it accessible for people because um, you know, when you see, uh, I think, for instance, a video, I, want, uh, I would love to see the video of, of how, how Kana got to, to the 50-50, the story you told. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, not everyone is going to look into the, to our data index, but yeah. if we can, you know, mm -hmm. everything is told by simple click in a video nowadays. I'm in communication. <laughs> and, I, and we worked on, um, and that's probably why I'm here, I worked on the creating the United States of Women uh, for the former White House. Um, and... Um, Doing that, we did a, a, a big video with uh, um, Oprah was on it. It was Michelle Obama. It was all, all power women like, like here. Um, and that video uh, traveled way beyond, you know, those who could go to the, uh, to the conference. And I think we, we have to package and mm. we have to do some storytelling around these things. And then data is that important point. It's if you don't. If the patient doesn't know it's sick, it's really hard to be a good doctor. Uh, and and yeah. I think these data points and these stories are the ones we need to know to point at and say, because uh, it's hard to understand sometimes with the unconscious bias and those things as well. Yeah, it's been a part of that. And that data piece comes around sort of the women in the peace negotiations mm -hmm. process, saying now that they can show they last, they have a 35% chance of lasting 15 years or longer if women are at the table. And, and Jessica, I want to bring you in on this sort of kind of a little bit of this impact piece, right? right? These stories of showing where it makes a difference and what you can see. Absolutely. And, and we work with tremendous women leaders around the world. I think of one in particular um, uh, human rights advocate uh, named Preeti Patkar, and she works to address uh, and protect children who are vulnerable to commercial sexual exploitation and human trafficking. And it was through her leadership in civil society, and I think that we've seen a lot more leadership of women in civil society. Uh, it was through that leadership that the government of India appointed her to a um, panel, a Supreme Court panel and an advisory committee uh, that looks at human trafficking. It was a government panel. She's the only civil society representative. and. She is someone who has direct access to how these policies and, and laws are, are implemented on the ground and what they look like for their intended beneficiaries, able to give that expertise and is able to um, have a tremendous impact in the way that the country is, is addressing the issue of human trafficking. And so you see examples like this and, and where maybe they're using data or they're using um, just their first-hand experience, but it's making a tremendous impact in the way that governments and communities are uh, addressing these issues. So I want to come back to, to your point, too, and maybe you can start with this. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. There's the enabling environment. So what policies, you know, do we need? And then there's kind of the second piece of it, which I think Canada comes in really strongly on, having a feminist foreign policy or a trade policy where you're actually taking those concerns into account. So Jessica, you talked a little bit about some of the policy and enabling environment. Do you want to yeah. touch on sort of what you think is important from where you sit? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's about taking a holistic approach to what is leading to gender inequality uh, around the world. And and we see common threads in, in every country around the world, whether it's the United States or or a country in Africa, Latin America, Asia. Um, I particularly work on gender-based violence. And we see, even in the United States, one in three um, was the stat the statistic that I that I mentioned that that has a tremendous effect on on the way that women operate in public space in private space and so without addressing those issues we look at sexual harassment in the workplace um, so it's not just about you know these complaints that that men are making about women taking positions it's the way that they treat women in the workplace mm -hmm. and so um, without addressing those issues and and something as simple as as unpaid work that that women disproportionately 
disproportionately take on the care uh, work that women take on in our society. Without addressing those issues, we um, can't move forward to, to reach uh, real parity. So addressing the cause, not the symptoms, Absolutely. are starting with there and then coming back out. Kirsten, I want to bring you in on this policies. So what, what our government has done, and it goes both to the unconscious sort of bias question and also to the question of um, analysis, policy analysis, is they have mandated that there is a gender GBA plus, a gender-based analysis plus analysis done by every public servant or every ministry that is bringing forward a policy initiative. And that, that just like you do a financial and a legal assessment and you, you take your policy and you, you map it against your legislative powers or all of the other things you have to do when you're bringing forward a policy, we are now required in every domain of our policy making to a, do a gender analysis. Um, and that is on top of some very, very clear policy direction that has been brought down through um, our current, uh, our, our feminist foreign policy, our feminist um, development policy, and an awful lot of work that's being done in the area of defense and security. And of course, we talk about trade uh, and our, our progressive trade agenda, a cornerstone of which is women's economic empowerment. So this, this, um, mindset of ensuring that all policy that we bring forward has consciously sort of taken a look at what unconscious biases might be out there, like I was describing earlier of, well, this is, there's, there isn't really a woman's issue here. There isn't a gender issue here. There isn't a diversity issue here. We are no longer able to do that because we are put through a process with everything we bring forward. And there's some really, really interesting results and I can, you know, I can talk about some of those, but we have some, some fantastic programming across all areas of our government. And then our budget came out, the last budget that came out in, uh, in 2017, uh, put money behind the projects, right? So they're all funded. 95% um, of every development project we have has to have a gender component, a women's empowerment component. And, and the money's behind it to get it done. Which is important as well. I see you nodding down there, Linda. You might have a few thoughts. <laughs> well, certainly uh, having uh, served most of my career either in Africa or in Africa working on humanitarian issues. And I've been uh, teaching a, a course uh, over the past semester at Georgetown University on South Sudan. And we did a whole uh, section of the course on the role of women in, in the peace process. And uh, that had there been more women at the table, not sitting behind, because there were women sitting behind uh, the men, but actually at the, at the peace table, we think we could have gotten uh, to peace in, in, in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. one of my recommendations from my class was that women had to be at the table. The table had to be made, uh, not even bigger, but room at the, at the table needed to be there for, for women because we know that they take into account those issues that are important to women and they force, force donors to take into account those issues that are important to women. So I was shaking my head as I heard that is because I was thinking we need to demand this with our money. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't just use our money uh, to carry out policies that uh, address the broad issues, but we have to get down deep and look at issues that relate to violence against women and uh, to have issues related to gender in in the peace uh, negotiation and have those in the consti constitutions of countries that are creating new constitutions, such as uh, what hopefully will happen one day in South Sudan. Fingers crossed, right? Yeah. Hello, I want to come back to some work you guys did on the United State of Women, and you chose a couple of issues at the, at the summit a couple of years ago, and one of them was this sort of violence against women piece. Yeah. And, and thinking about those, excuse my phone, as those policies. Talk a little bit about this policy piece. Um, I actually don't, I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on that policy. Yep. Uh, I'm, but from the advocacy angle, was it important to be talking about sort of some of the levers to push for women's leadership? Of course. And I think that, that was what the summit was about. It was to get, gather everyone around and, and having all the issues at the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I wish I was, uh, as, uh, 
good at knowing the policies as those who work in government. But I, uh, um, that was the whole, the whole idea was to, to gather a summit to have all the issues on the table and make sure that they, 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 they work with each other. And it's happening again now uh, on the 5th and, 5th and 6th of uh, May in Los Angeles. And Michelle Obama's coming. So Fabulous. Yeah. So before I turn it over to the audience, I'm going to start with you, Linda. I'm going to warn you. Um, what's the one policy or behavior? I mean, to get to 2050, if we could choose one thing, or what is one important thing, since we know it's holistic and it's not one thing and trying to stay away from the silver bullet solution. But, um, but what do you think in terms of a policy or a commitment or an actionable behavior? You know, I think we, we have to actually make the decisions. We have to do what Canada has done, uh, and that is establish the policy and implement it. Uh, we hear a lot of, of good words in the United States about uh, gender equity. But it's actually making it happen that sometimes we don't see. When we, when we walk into a room and uh, you're sitting at a table, and I, it happens to me all the time, I walk in, into the room and I'm sitting at the table and it's all men and me. And so when that happens, it's important that we say something. You know, we hear say something, uh, you know, and do something. We have to say something that is embarrass people but also do something to ensure that that is happening. When I saw this list of, of panelists, I noticed immediately that we were 80% women, and that was really, really important. So as the 20% man on the panel, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> not to put that you in an awkward about. position, <laughs> are, you're clear on that, the numbers are showing it. Yes. Yeah. From where you sit, it's so act and notice. which Act I and is. notice and say something. Yeah, the say yes. something is important. The say something is really important. You can't just sit quietly and say, hmm, I'm the only woman in this room. And then walk out and tell me about it or somebody else. Yes. Not actually you say it at the table. Happens. You Go say it in front of the audience. You embarrass people. And it's important that the men do that too. And I yeah. think if you look across, we, have, we hold the keys. We're the ones who can help affect this change really quick. And I think this issue has become something that has made a lot of men afraid to, mm. to take a stand. But if you mm. ask around, I know very few men that are for inequality. Uh, there are very few who, who will take a stand against, uh, <laughs> against <laughs> equality. But if you look at, uh, if, you, if I ask my friends if they're feminists, they, they take a pause and then they don't really know exactly mm -hmm. if they are or if they're not. And I think as a communicator, again, I think that Feminism, there's been so many great things done in the name of feminism, but it didn't have the right advertising agency maybe back in the days. <laughs> yeah. uh, because what happens is that it's, a, it's, you know, it's in the name of equality. And, um, you know, democracy is equality. Equality is feminism. And if you want democracy, you're a feminist. It's that, it's that simple. Uh, so I think, but these are, this is communication. It's, it's, I can, as, you know, as a man, I feel the... Finally, the wave too of this getting to to the right place, but we we need more we need more men. Uh, not too many men on this stage, but we we do need <laughs> we do need need men to do it too because we can we really can help. And look at the audience. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's there man. There's man. <laughs> yeah, you're it. <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but you're here too. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'd also like that democracy, equality, feminism sort of equation that you put, which I yeah. think is the it's way to... It's actually quite simple, all of this, and, and a lot of things have become very complex. Mm. Uh, obviously, there are lots of, we're talking about lots of countries, lots of data and a lot of things, but at, at the core, uh, in a way, the first division of humanity was, was man-woman, and it, if we can't fix that one, then I have very little hope for all the other <laughs> issues in a way. So I think it's, it is that simple. It's 50-50. It's, it's the 50 /50. It's, how we're built. I love that. Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, and, and uh, to, to piggyback on, on to what you're saying, I think that addressing social norms is, is one of the, the key things that, that we need to focus on, winning people's hearts. And, and whether that is addressing notions of manhood and masculinity, which, which do ultimately have such an effect uh, across our society, it really is about, about looking at how we are socialized, how we are uh, putting together as, as a society the idea of leadership, 
as a whole, whether for women or or for men, but but making sure that we're addressing those issues across the board. So again, as a, as I've mentioned, looking at the issues of gender-based violence or the issue of of women and girls' education or or economic opportunities. There are plenty of, of wonderful business women that end up running for office or human rights advocates that also running for office. So it's making sure that we're creating that enabling environment. Absolutely. So I have a, a fairly um, sort of down-to-earth example that, that left an impression on me recently. We have... Um, in, in an organization that I was working in recently, we had two senior leaders, men, um, take parental leave. One took three months and one took six months of parental leave. Um, and it was the first time that men from the executive cadre in our organization had done that. And the reactions were interesting. They were twofold, really. Mm -hmm. Some reacted, both men and women, in a way like, whoa, oh, really, wow, we need, you can't take three months, you can't take six, what are you, doing? Are you yeah. doing? And then many were like, oh, okay, because it, it created a, an environment for um, less senior people, both men and women, to say, okay, this is okay for everyone, this is equality, this is everybody being treated you know, in a way where it's socially acceptable to to make these choices. And I think that's really important. And, you know, we recently had our first, um, one of the one of the consequences of having a 50-50 federal cabinet is we had our first uh, federal cabinet minister um, have a baby uh, very recently, a couple months ago. And what, and, and, and the U.S. has had in the Senate, right? You've had the yeah. similar experience yeah. very recently. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what, what happened was we discovered, or it was discovered, that there was no parental policy of any kind for her to continue her functions and be a new mom. And so I, I put these two concepts together because it affects families, and families are made up of men and women and, you know, all sorts of configurations. But if we want to be working together, if we want to be, as, as you say, kind of bringing the two sides of our of of who we are as a as a race, as a human race, together, then we need to be thinking of these things from all sides. And I think it's a point too of sort of valuing men in the workforce for both their professional and their personal choices mm -hmm. and being able to say, you know, in the same way I know Sweden has done a while ago, which is valuing the dad as a dad, but in the workforce being able to have that happen and people to go, that's okay, as opposed to, wow, what is he doing? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that sort of thing. In Sweden, it's 16 months uh, paid parental leave and you... Thank you for reminding and us. You have to, <laughs> and, you, and the man is, uh, is uh, uh, encouraged to take half. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, lot of Swedish men with baby Bjorns and strollers in the cafes and stuff. <laughs> I see those, the yeah, latte yes. dads, right? Isn't, yeah. that the, yes. isn't that the phrase? So we have a few minutes, and I want to turn it over to, to this audience. And uh, we will start in the front row here with Diana Negroponte, and we will move back. I'm Diana Negroponte, and I'm a colleague of Gwen Young's here at the Wilson Center. I'm going to take up a point that Pele you raised, and I'm going to contradict you. And I'm going to shame <laughs> our two American panelists. <laughs> In 2016, we went to the election for president, and we ignored a cultural phenomena in the Midwest among our white working class voters. And I'm going to ask you how we resolve this problem of the white working class voter who wanted to hold on to the traditional male dominated household and who feared that a woman president would undermine a traditional male dominated household. How do we address this? You started with Pele, right? Is that yeah. fair to put you? All right. <laughs> Should I? We'll back okay. you up. Linda and I have some ideas. The, uh, so it's per answering personally. I think the answer is always empathy. I think I, I went personally into this election protecting with, with what I be believed in minorities, thinking that was something that I believed in, in, in protecting. And I realized there was a big suffering majority that I hadn't really seen. 
And I think we, in order to, to solve division is to, is to unify. So if we don't understand what it's like to be that, we, whether, whether we like the reaction to it or not, we have to. That's the only way to turn it around is to understand. You, can't, you cannot push it away. But it was a, a blind spot for me, a, a Swede who moved to, to the US. I probably should have seen it from the outside a little bit more. But uh, I th so that for me is, is the answer. And that's the good thing with what has happened is that we have a whole or few generations are now the ears are up around politics and around uh, these issues. And I think that's what's going to make it turn around. I'm positive. And I think it's also having conversations and having difficult conversations with, uh, with people who are different from you. Uh, I went to Charlottesville right after the Charlottesville um, incident. And I was speaking to, to an audience and I could see that there were people who were angry in the, in the audience and I said to, to them, that one of the things that I think we're missing when we look at this very disaffected uh, white um, population is we're not talking to them about the things that actually matter. And most of the things that matter to them matter to people who are struggling regardless of race. And that it was important for whites and blacks, for example, to talk about those issues that matter to us that are not racial issues. They've been put in racial terms, but they're not racial issues. And I noticed in the audience people nodding their heads, and they came up uh, to me afterwards, and there were about four or five who were from West Virginia who said, you know, we never thought about the fact that we actually have something in common with poor black people and we ought to be talking to, to those people. So I think it's important that we have the conversations, that we try not to avoid having uncomfortable conversations, uh, that we talk about race, uh, for example. We talk about gender. Uh, and, and we have those conversations on a, on a regular basis, uh, and not the yelling and screaming that we're seeing on TV now that just drives me, me nuts, but actually civilized conversations where people talk about what they're feeling and how it's affecting them. And maybe how, if you'd voted for uh, this woman president, she would have made a difference in, in, in your life. And we need to be talking to people now about what's happening in their lives and say to them, is this what you wanted? And have them give, give and, and be understanding and empathetic. Uh, to 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 their feelings, and I and I think, like you said, it's about listening. And to bring it to back to a couple points we were talking about on the panel, you know, being diverse or you know, acting in the name of diversity is not an easy thing to do. So part of it is looking outside. You know, we all operate in our networks, which means we hear what are the interests of our networks. So there's that that conversation piece. But the other thing too is, is I think we're talking about gender today is you know, not all women are the same either. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of scholarship and research on the women's movement in the US and the split. I mean, we're we are not one group of women in the United States, and we are not one group of women globally. And so I think part of it is trying to link sort of the policies piece with what are you going to do and sort of try to disassociate that from, from the gender, mm -hmm. hopefully from the party as much as possible, not to be too political in that response. But the, the dialogue about and the deliberate acting and noticing and saying something to say, you know, I didn't realize that this is what was happening. But I also think to remember as we're talking about gender and as, I, as I'm trying to talk about this globally, it's not all the same women. And from a governance perspective, you want your government to look like the people in society, as Tiffany was showing in the film. And that's not one group, one race or one socioeconomic group. Can I just introduce a solution? Sure. Yes. 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 Grab your microphone. Thank you. Uh, there is something that we can do, and that's yeah. mentoring. And it's mentoring by teachers. It's mentoring that's great. by local officials so that those young women look up and said, I want to be like her. And it's the starting at home that Jessica and Kirsten were talking about, but the active mentoring to say, I want to be like her, and this is what we need to do. And I have a mentoring colleague in the audience as well. Yeah. Do we have another? We have a question right over here. Hi, um, Elizabeth Newberry, also from the Wilson Center. Thank you guys so much for joining us and for 
the tremendous points that you made on the panel. I actually wanted to pick up on the mentoring element. It's, I do a lot of research here for the science and technology program around women in STEM issues. And mentoring is a very apparent dialogue that academia is using to sort of galvanize more women going into STEM fields. And I was wondering if you could provide any examples or any ways that sort of a ball on the ground example of how mentoring programs have been used in this space as well. I'll give you an example. I was in Nigeria uh, uh, maybe about a year ago with Secretary Kerry, and uh, we have a STEM program for, uh, for young women. And I was astounded just in a year what had happened to these women who had come from environments where they weren't even encouraged to be educated, and suddenly they were being creative, and they were being scientific, and they were being mathematical. Uh, because they were given the opportunity. And so I think it's really important that we mentor and that we encourage and that we support programs that will provide opportunities for young women to do things differently from what we did. I always thought I was terrible in math. I mean, I avoided a math course like nobody's business because I thought I was terrible. I didn't realize I could learn it. I thought it was innate and that some people had it and some people didn't, and I didn't have it. Uh, if I had it to do all over again, you know, go back, you know, 50 years in my life and start all over, you know, who knows? I might have been a doctor and not a diplomat. Uh, <laughs> and that would have been great. But it's having the, the role models and the mentoring and the people who are saying to you, yes, you can do this if you want to do it. I think even to add on to that, you know, Vital Voices, we do quite a bit of mentorship and, and not just mentorship, but peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Because when you're looking at changing the way that men and women view the world and their role, it often comes better hearing it from someone who's in a similar position as you are. Um, so we focus on that quite a bit because there is, um, again, looking at, at uh, judges, for instance, judges and, and how they are addressing issues related to um, whether it's divorce or gender-based violence, again, violence against women, um, they are more likely to listen to another judge than another person coming in. And so making sure that you are not just creating opportunities for mentorship, but peer-to-peer -peer exchanges on these issues. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump my moderator prerogative for a second because we work with a partner called the Global Give Back Circle on mentoring, which goes a bit to about what Diana and Liz were talking about, where we have women in the U.S. ambassadors such as yourselves or women at Microsoft or in the private sector, and they're mentoring high school girls in Rwanda and Kenya. And they're doing two hours of Skype time a month. The girls are getting leadership training on the weekends, going back to confidence, what are the possibilities? And then they're coming out with the mentor support but everyone also is coming out with this sort of cross-cultural realization of what, what is the same and different. You know, you have technology now, so you can get on Skype and do this, see something different, be exposed to. And so one of the young women is up here at the IMF. The other is, is now a meteorologist on the Kenya station, television station. So just, you know, and this notion, and, and for the, the women in the Microsoft, not speaking for everybody, right, but in whole, it's part of this, also this giving back and understanding what's going on you know, going back to those pieces of about it. So that role of mentoring is very important. One last question back here in the last row, more or less. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. This is really insightful. Um, my name is Giovanni Mortal. I'm with CARE2. We represent um, roughly 45 million um, online activists and supporters of progressive causes. Um, my question to you is, how can you address the issue of gender um, and some of the issues related to like family leave? Because we talk about this, um, and I think there's a class element that's lost when we talk about this. You know, talk about family leave for women and for fathers, but what about the service economy? You know, the single mothers who work at Starbucks, uh, the single fathers who work in the service economy, where this kind of consideration is not even an option for them. And I think sometimes when I come to these sessions, I hear these great things and they're phenomenal. And then I think about my sister who works in the service economy. And I think of how would something like that ever apply to her? And how do we address issues of gender inequality and benefits 
to um, address that culture, that group of workers in our, you know, in our nation. Kirsten, you want to start? <laughs> well, so I think I can't speak for your nation. I, I, in, in Canada, we have a legislated uh, requirement of offering not 18 months, but 12 months of paid parental leave. Uh, so you cannot lose your job uh, and you get uh, essentially benefits up to, I, I might get the number wrong, but I think it's 70% of your salary for 12 months guaranteed. I'm, I'm glad you raised that subject, and I, I remember as the Me Too movement began uh, to evolve, one of the areas that uh, was going to be focused on women in the service industry and how they can be brought in into this, uh, because we can't forget uh, that everybody is not as privileged as, as we are, and that they too uh, have requirements. And so I appreciate you raising that, is not something that I can affect as a work person, but I can affect it as in my personal life in terms of pushing for issues that will uh, encompass the women who are, and, and men who are in the service industry and ensuring that they get a living wage because it's, it's, it's basic for them. It's not even about just getting leave. It's about their everyday wages and whether they make enough money uh, to take care of their, their, their families. And, um, and it's something that I think we all have to, to work to improve. It'll be interesting to see if the experiment with universal basic income may make a difference mm. for the different sectors of a society like that. But I think this is probably, in the interest of time, but it's sort of a great you know, question to end on is also caregiving applies to kids and family members as well, but it sort of talks about the stereotypical roles, which we talked a bit about today about behavior, talks about the policies that are in place that, that are there. We've talked about sort of the differences in the groups, and I think the important thing today on 50 by 50, after we thank this wonderful panel, is to realize there are things that we can do, these pledges and commitments, and I think you should go online and make your pledge and commitment, but I'm gonna steal from from Linda's, you know, say something. Let's act and let's say something about all this. You know, notice is the first thing, and then it's to say something. So I want to ask you all to give our panelists a wonderful round of applause. Thank you for all of your insights, and thank you for coming to the Wilson Center.